Good evening. This is the fourth meeting of the color course here at the Barnstone Studios. And uh, from the looks of the homework, you are generally coming to terms with a good deal of this material. Some of you are still having some difficulty, and some of you uh, perhaps paid a little bit too much attention when I was indicating what in perspective these panels should be doing. Whose is this? Okay, that's a little... We wanted to get this effect with parallel lines. And, and we're doing it. We're, we're bringing... This is... Actually, this is going... This is coming forward, that's going back, this is coming forward, that's going back, and this is coming forward. It's more subtle here. These are more pleasing colors. Was this the underpainting that wasn't finished? Whose is that? Is that yours? Also, you were striving for these colors, and this is what you got. Very interesting. Curious. Um, this is very successful. This is very successful. This much less so. I don't know what happened between these two. Do you know? They're both yours, right? No. Oh, whose is this? Uh, That's yours. Yeah. Ah, this is whose? Nobody's going I'll take to. Yeah. <laughs> but who did it? Whose is it? Which one? This one. That's mine. Oh, all right. Okay. It's very successful. You're too intense here. Everything else is muted and very nice. And this. If you close one eye and cover that, you'll see how much unity you have. And when you expose that, it becomes the subject of the whole piece. It's just too intense and too light. It draws attention to itself. Uh, whose is this? You're, you're not following the instructions when I ask you to mix. I want you to do a row from a mixture and have looking at the painting on the wall, please. Then I want you to have the next color down here, and I want you to mix that into the big batch that this came from and do the next row, and that a tiny bit more, and do another row, and do that until you get about here, and then start mixing this into that first batch. And it'll be as gradual as these. Do you see it? And they are, for the most part, quite gradual. This. Whose is this? Your pigment is so thick that it's yeah. got highlights and shadows. I did it again using less paint. This is yours? No, the other. Not the one next to it, but this second row is yeah. Still thick, but much better. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. See, you're not having any trouble mixing and applying the paint. It's going on well. You're getting it a little thick and you're lifting your brush up too quickly and you're getting these fine peaks like and it and you don't want to do that in a painting because they collect dust they have highlights they've cast shadows they can really uh, disturb the surface of the piece um, here there's there's not an adequate matching of the upper coat and the value of the undercoat this is whose okay you're doing all right your touches are too big for the scale of the piece and you're not matching. And what I suggest is that you put the tiniest touch of the second coat down on top of the undercoat. And then holding the piece up in the light, tipping it in various directions to see if in one angle it's much lighter or much darker. And then making the adjustment and putting another touch down touches that you can immediately cover with a brush stroke and then you don't have to worry about it and when you get them so that tipping and letting the light hit the canvas from different angles and you can see it's identical or so close it doesn't matter then you can paint you would have found that this if you'd done that you would have been able to spare yourself this criticism and it's it's a shame it's a shame because it breaks it up terribly. This is whose? All right. Your colors are too intense. 
your values are way off. This is much too light. And uh, disfiguring the rectangle really didn't promote anything very successful. This is whose? And you've only got one coat down? All right. This is whose? All right, it's very muted. You don't have any value change here that gives you uh, a separation between this interior rectangle and the border. That's not very good because part of what it is you should be doing is matching values. And if you can't develop a keen sense of value, you can't paint. Color's important, but I've had students who are colorblind. I had, a meta, I had an Ed Moffat. Did I mention him earlier? I usually bring him up in the color course because he was the advertising manager for a little business called Bethlehem Steel. So he placed all the advertising for Bethlehem Steel, and when he retired, Time Magazine gave him a, re a retirement party and made a mock cover with him on it for the occasion because, of course, he'd sent millions of dollars worth of advertising to these magazines. He was colorblind. And when he came to me, he said, I want to paint, and I know I'm colorblind. Can you help me? So I said, let's find out which colors you can't see well. And we discovered what they were, and they were all reds and oranges. And I said, well, let's not paint them. So we, we rigged Fletcher palettes that allowed him to leave those colors out, but to create their presence by emphasizing the split complementary opposite. And others could see those colors, even if he couldn't, and he was able to paint with me for about 20 years. And he, he really, really uh, got enormous satisfaction out of something he thought was impossible for him to do. It was interesting, after he passed away, I visited his wife, and she was in tears that day, knowing that you know, I was his old teacher, and I asked why she was so upset. She said, because I thought he was 65, and when he passed away, he was 85. I give him credit. I think that's quite an achievement, don't you? <laughs> that's quite an achievement. Anyway. Ed was, Ed was quite a character, but he was, he was on Normandy with Eisenhower. So he was called the Little Colonel. He wasn't very tall for the rest of his life. Do any of you have any questions about this homework? Can you tell me again what I did wrong in mixing the colors? This one? Yes. You did a couple of rows of paint, and then you added a whole bunch of paint to the mix, and you got a sudden change of value. So you added something to this mix that made it too dark. Then, throwing caution to the wind, you added something too light and got that change of value. Then, in a cavalier fashion, <laughs> caring nothing for appearance, <laughs> should I go on? I think I got it. You got it. The idea is you, the idea is you, <laughs> you add a little and you get a subtle change. And by adding a little each time, what these people are doing is getting transitions that look as if they're airbrushed. There aren't any interruptions. Yours has a thumping tempo that theirs lacks. But we're not doing, you know, boogie woogie. Huh? Too much, imagine. Well, you're adding too much too quickly. And uh, you're painting for a while and whistling and having a wonderful time, and you think, well, maybe I should add some more. So you take a spoonful and you dump it in, and you get the look. Look at how cleverly you jump from light to dark to light. I mean, that's that. Well, anyway, you get you get the idea. You get the idea. Yeah, yeah. You want these transitions to be as delicate as can be because, let's say this were a sky. It wouldn't explain itself with these bands. It would be. Uh, you know, the, the sky above you is a blue, blue violet. And as it gets down toward the horizon, it gets increasingly less intense. And compared to the way it started, it looks warm. And because it's going to end up 
next to a blue or blue-violet horizon, it's going to look yellow-orange. Because the blue-violets of that horizon, the violets going to pull out their complementary opposites. You don't want sudden changes in the sky unless there are cloud formations or just that, some kind of a cloud formation that would alter it. And the more smoothly you can make this transition, the less the viewer of your painting is going to be drawn to clumsiness in paint application. You want it to be so subtle and so delicate, and I'll be showing slides repeatedly showing you ground planes, skies, tabletops, all of these transitional elements that are just like this assignment. I have a new assignment for you here, and the, the object now is to create greater, a greater sense of atmosphere, space relationships, and tonight we're going to worry about warping a plane, twisting a plane. But these planes are supposed to be rectangles and they are supposed to look as if they tip forward and tip back. And uh, that was the assignment. And some of you did very, very well. Some of you had some obvious problems. Do you have any questions about anything we've discussed so far? Okay, yes. Now, what would I have added to the uh, blue-violet uh, to get it to be a little uh, grayer or a little less intense? All right, the, the, you're having a problem with language. You said less intense and brighter. Brighter usually means lighter value. Less intense means intensity. Let's keep them separate. Let's say we're using Fletcher's terminology. For color, he says temperature. For value, he uses the term value. That means light or dark on a scale of white to black with seven values of gray in between. Intensity is the strength of the color. And we've seen that some colors right out of the tube have enormous staining power, and you can't use much of them because they'll over overwhelm anything they're mixed with. The monastral colors, the thalo colors, are prime examples of how that ruins everything. Useless. You use it, but you use it with enormous care. You're better off using emerald green, viridian, and Prussian blue than using thalo blue or thalo green. I mean, they're just extremely powerful. However, if you want to establish this value, you take a look at the instructions, and if it said a number five value, you mix a number five gray. Immediately, a number five gray. Then, if it's a blue-violet, and the code on the homework said blue-violet, number five value, at middle-low intensity, all you're going to do is take a little of this raw blue-violet pigment, and you've mixed up this number five value over here, and you'll add the tiniest bit to it, and you will lift it from dead neutral to a slightly more intense color. I think you started with a blue-violet, and it was so powerful that as you diminished it in intensity, you were impressed with how much less intense it was than what you started with, but you had grabbed the dog by the wrong end, and the tail was now wagging you. You start with the value, that's easy. And be, now what you might always do is have a warm, neutral, center neutral, and a cooler one. And if you're going to be mixing up a cool neutral, which is what you would want as a base for blue-violet, that you would mix up to a number five value and add a little bit of the 
French Altmarine. You might have to lighten it a little because the French Altmarine is darker and darkened it a little bit. So what you're doing is what Fletcher calls tuning. And what you're doing is you, 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 you add raw pigment, it darkens it, you have to compensate by lightening it. And you could lighten it because you've got a few light values of neutral, and instead of adding white to it, you add a number four value, which brings the five up a little bit that went down to a six because of the, fr the French Isle of the Marine. Is it making sense now? There was, and I, I mentioned this before, there was a painter who taught color at the academy, and his slogan was, mix, mix slowly so you can paint quickly. Because if you have to stop and mix color over and over and over again because you have nothing on your palette that's right, it takes you forever and there's no pleasure in painting. If you spend a half, three quarters of an hour setting up a palette, and you've got the neutrals you need, and you've got most of the tints and tones you need. This is the way palettes were mixed for centuries. You can start blending with a brush, adding a little of this and that, and just going like mad, because you have paid your dues. You've set up the palette to serve the painting, and it's critical, yes. Would you ever add white to pigment to your mixture after you're adding gray to lighten it? Absolutely. There's nothing else usually you could lighten it with. But what I just finished saying was, if you add, now there are a couple of whites. Titanium white is a very strong white. A, a flake white substitute that Winsor Newton makes is a white that is imitating lead white. We don't want to use lead anymore. People have decided it'll kill us along with everything else. But uh, it's so strong, titanium, that a little bit of it changes the value too much. So painters have never used it when they're doing facial complexions. They want to change the colors they find in a person's complexion the tiniest bit. So they've always used flake white, which now there's a substitute for. If you use flake white, you have to use a lot of it to change the value a little. So it gives you more authority than the titanium, which causes it to jump. So the idea is mix some grays with the flake white. So you're not putting raw white into the mixture you want to lighten, but you're taking a higher value on the value step scale of neutral and adding that to it. And in that case, it won't go up too much too suddenly. You can readjust it by altering its temperature. Remember that was, a, that was his term for color. And you have control. But the idea is you set up your palette, you tune everything. And tonight we're going to set up a palette for this assignment. And this is in uh, red, orange, green, blue, violet, which is what we're using. So I'm going to use it all the time for a while. So you, as I said, if you get used to one of these palettes, you've understood them all but you really have an understanding of something. So you're going to tune your red, orange, your green, and your blue, violet, and your green will probably be viridian. And if you think that's a bit too blue, you'll add the tiniest bit of maybe cadmium yellow to it. Okay, not much, but a tiny bit will bring it around. Your blue, violet's okay right out of the tube. Your yellow will be yellow ochre with a bit of cadmium yellow added to it. Uh, the orange will be Prussian, will be, uh, what am I saying, will be burnt sienna with a little cadmium yellow added to it because burnt sienna is too low in intensity. Your red violet, you can use alizarin crimson. And uh, if you use a blue, you'll use a Prussian blue. Remember, this is a middle intensity palette. We're not going to use extremely powerful colors. Yes. The red orange will be burnt sienna with the addition of cadmium orange, a little of it, to raise it in intensity because burnt sienna is just too much of a dull brown earth and it's not, it has no kick at all. The cadmium orange will bring it up. Yeah. When, then I want you to mix 
uh, a yellow at this point by mixing green and red orange. I want a blue violet and green mixed for a blue, blue green at this point. And if you mix blue violet and red orange, you're going to get a very low intensity red violet there. So when the color you want, see this would be here. So you'd, you could mix it here by mixing this color with the neutral at that point, or you could mix this color with that to get it at that point. Do you understand it? So if you have three colors here and you've got your neutral, you might not come out here once in one of my assignments, finding that, in fact, on that wall, we have a whole bunch of central triangles. And most of the painting you see that you think is such powerful color is mixed in this zone. Nobody's mixing color out of a tube. There's a fellow by the name of Bratby in England. He was a kitchen sink painter. Nobody remembers him now. But he used to squeeze right out of the tube onto his canvases. And it looked like he did that, which wasn't very agreeable. Certainly, I didn't think so. So, let's look at some paintings, and I will ask you some questions about them. And I will discuss some of the things that these artists are doing. And then we will discuss today's assignment. And you'll go into the other room and you'll mix up the colors and you'll do a quick little sketch. Yes, Michael. Um, for green, if, you, if you're using color green, how would you? No, I didn't say. I said do not use phthalo green. That's all I have. So oh, oh. Well, what are we going to do about that? If you mix, if you mix viridian with yellow green, you will get a green that's down here between these two. Do you see what I'm saying? That's called tuning. You can avoid any real green at all. And I mentioned earlier in this course that when Judy Fritchman, whose color is so fine, prepares her colors, and let's say she's in this key, she'll mix orange and red to make her red orange. She'll mix yellow orange and yellow green to make her yellow. She'll use yellow green and blue green to make her green, and blue and violet to make her blue violet. She won't use any raw color. And yet, because of the way she underpaints and the way she juxtaposes warms and cools, you'd never know that she had subdued her colors that dramatically. Most painters tune their color, and they don't want raw color on the palette at all. It's of no use to them. Some artists have a great pile of neutral in the middle that they dip a brush into first because there are painters who give uh, exhibitions at the academies. And one of them does this precisely. He doesn't explain how he arrives at that neutral, but he's using a system similar to Fletcher. This was, I think I mentioned, in the air. There were, there were artists in England, and there were artists in France, and there were artists in the United States who had arrived at this approach. And there was a Jacobs at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and there were others writing books. I have most of those books. So these are not secrets. But everybody's set their palette up. They haven't just started to squeeze out color and start painting. I mean, I've told you, I've been to the Met, and I've seen people copying 17th century Dutch or Spanish paintings. And they've laid out cadmium and cerulean and these colors weren't invented for 300 years, 200 years. And they're adding black to them to get them down where they look like what those artists were using. And their display of ignorance is just painful. I mean, far be it for me to open my mouth. I just keep walking, shaking my head helplessly and feeling sorry for Velasquez and Goya and all the good boys, you know. So let's look at some slides and see what we can see.
This is a still life by Pizarro. Pizarro was an old man when he met Cezanne and Monet and the others. And he came from the Caribbean. And he arrived in, in, in France. And he became a post-impressionist. And for a while, Cezanne studied with him and called Pizarro his master because he learned a great deal about what Pizarro had discovered in the years before he met Cezanne. Can you see how everything has been neutralized to the point of there being not a single intense color in the whole piece? I mean, this is a red-orange. This beige is a yellow, very low intensity. All of these colors have been reduced. You know, there's, a, there's an Indian red back here that's been neutralized. The red-orange for the pear has been neutralized. The greens and these pears have been neutralized. All of these are cool neutrals. These are warmer neutrals. But there's nothing intense going on at all. And it's pleasing, and it's a pleasant design. Personally, I find that the contrast in the roses that are in the wallpaper are too strong. If you close one eye, and you cover this and that, and you get used to what you're seeing, and then you expose them, I think you'll see they come off the background and they float. They don't stay on the wallpaper. Now, were they lighter and more neutral, they would step back. However, I must say, this is not an original painting by Pizarro that we're looking at. It's probably a fifth generation product. It was photographed. It was turned into slides. It was reproduced in a book. I photographed the book. The book image was translated into another slide. God knows what, <laughs> how much resemblance there is between what you're looking at and the original piece. Nonetheless, it's the best I have to teach with. And I think that it calls up enough about what Pizarro was doing for us to learn something from it. Here's another subject up against the same wallpaper. The roses are staying back a little bit better except for where they get too contrasty and they float. And everything in this is warm except the cool vase. So this is in what key? Blue. Very clearly in blue. Everything else is warm. This one I don't really think is in a key. Because there aren't any cools in it. Everything is pretty much warm. So I might say it's sort of a monochromatic piece. Oranges, yellows, low oranges red violets. Notice how he keeps the edges of the vase very soft. That allows the, the forms of the vase, the sphere, the cylinder, the cones, as they come close to the edge to disappear and turn around. Cezanne was quoted as saying, the edge eludes me. But what he was saying is there is no edge. And this is, in his drawings, he does all these little tiny bracelet lines at the edges because what he's trying to do is show you that umbrella that we explore in drawing one. All those little edges that are turning away is what he's referring to because there is no edge. So when he wants to bring this closer, he makes it harder and a little, a little advance. He allows that to dissolve to recede. He wants this to come closer so he in, he, he strengthens the dark on a light and strengthens the light on the middle values and that advances. This is more, all more intense and this is the most intense range of, of color of the apples that are in that bowl and then this edge is very contrasty and he strengthens the lights with dark halos 
and the lights he has accents on so that advances while these recede. He's doing the same here. He's not trying to make it too crisp. Where it accidentally gets a little crisp, that jumps forward. You squint and look at it, it'll come ahead of this. We don't want that. We want to keep the contrast very subdued and the edges very, very soft. But he's playing with all of these warm red violets and red oranges and it's this cool note that is the odd man out and the key. This is Sisley, and I don't think it's in a key. I find all of this too light. Close one eye, cover that corner with two fingers of one. Get used to it. Now the bottom of the table is coming forward, isn't it? Now expose that upper corner, and it's the closest thing to you. Did you see it jump? You cannot afford to have that degree of high contrast in a background because the contrast, the lightest against the darkest, is going to draw the eye and that is going to leap forward. So you invest it here, not there. Sisley's not one of the most important painters to have ever lived and this is not a great piece. But this is the round table and he's violated this principle of reducing intensity, temperature, and value contrast as you recede, and as a consequence, it is not very effective. This is a student work. It was done many, many years ago. And the student is working in the key of yellow-orange, green, and playing with some blue-greens over here. These are all green-yellow-green neutrals and being very concerned about the way the light illuminates the spherical form, the core of the shadows here, the reflected lights here. The problem here is that the cast shadow is ill-drawn, too intense, and has too hot an edge. And what we needed here, and he didn't do it effectively, was this light halo which passes through the table to pass through the far side of this and throw this ahead of the shadow. This and that are the same value, so we lose form at that point. You're going to be asked to paint a couple of pieces of fruit here later in the semester. That's what we're working up to. So start thinking about the kinds of fruit you'd like to paint and thinking about the kinds of colors you would like to incorporate into the scheme and maybe going out and buying some very neutral papers that are used for pastels. Canson does some very lovely muted neutral colors that you could use as a ground plane and a background. So you start planning how you're going to arrange and light the piece. There's another student working and it has more unity. You can see the degree of neutrality in all of this. The Again, this is too contrasty and it jumps forward, this one can live with because it is nearer. But the light halo should have continued through the edge of that shadow. But you can see these things are greatly reduced in intensity. This is much lighter, again, very neutral. And the principles learned when we drew the, the sphere have been forgotten because this chops this up terribly, which is unfortunate but the edges where these planes meet are soft. And uh, again, this is too contrasty, so this is coming forward when you squint, and this is going back, which is exactly the reverse of what you want. You would have wanted this more intense than that, and it isn't. And you might have wanted this warmer, because warm colors tend to advance and ghouls recede. Not always, but it's, it's worth keeping in mind. This is you and Uglo. And the title gives you some idea of his corny sense of humor. Because there were a couple of pieces of fruit which rotted, staining the table. So his title is, Two Others Have Been There. They're now gone. They've been thrown away as they deteriorated. But he's not as interested in developing the third dimension as I will ask you to be. But he has used these bracelet lines which would be reminiscent of the umbrella from the sphere, 
to suggest the third dimension and a, and a hemispherical form. This is Uglo again. You can see his golden section touches. He always leaves ample evidence of his grid. And here he's reticulating the surface with bracelet lines that suggest the spherical form. And he's fracturing pieces of the apple, which will be coming planes that are looking in different directions. And that's what we're going to be doing with the homework for tonight, twisting and turning planes and manipulating them. This is simply a two-dimensional foil. And I think this is unfortunate because the docks here and there throw this as a light figure forward on a dark ground. I think that's an error. I don't think that's a good idea. Had he made this darker and this lighter, he would have made all of these docks bring that upper portion forward. Instead, he's bringing that line forward because there are lights on either side of it, and this is no longer part of that mass of the apple. This is uh, Redon, and it's a beat. Pretty simply done. And he's, I think, made the background much too dark. If you cover that with your hand and get used to the values in the beat and the ground plane, they're all variations on yellow, low-intensity yellow and low-intensity orange and red-orange. And when you expose it, the background doesn't belong there. It just, I think, is a terrible mistake. It may have been a far wall that wasn't getting light, and this may have been the edge of a table. I don't think it matters. I have no idea what that's all about. But he was something of a, a symbolist, a surrealist. Claudia Rilling did these while she was here as a student. And I think they're extremely well designed. This ground plane really goes back into space along that diagonal. All of these forms read as volumes. The cast shadows sometimes have a slightly too dark edge, but with all of their reflected lights and passage and halos are pretty well handled for a young student. I think it's a successful piece. She's darkened this all around in the vignette and in so doing cooled it because now we're moving toward cool neutrals where everything else for the most part is warm. So she's kept a very simple scheme oranges, yellow oranges, red oranges, for everything, until she gets to the vignette. And then she's going toward a blue-violet, blue of very low intensity. And it strengthens the warmth of all of this very nicely. You and Uglo again, and he is choosing these breads because the, the baking process causes the crust of these breads to become brittle and fracture. And that fracturing is a reticulation of the surface. And it gives you, the painter, planes that you can lay on the surface. Remember I showed you Uccello's chalice in drawing one, and all of those planes are squares. Well, it's a way of translating smooth round surfaces into fractured surfaces so you can emphasize and exaggerate the roundness of something. And that's what all of these little planes are doing. He's curious. He puts a thumbtack in the bread. I have no idea. He's got a strange sense of humor. He's reticulating all of this, too. This is a crustier bread. And the planes work more as reticulations than they did in the other bread. Do you see it? And they follow these elliptical sequences which exaggerate the roundness of the form. And his cast shadow is flooded with reflected light. And he breaks it down into straight line intervals. And everything in this is formalized on straight lines. Gives him a crispness, a bite, a clarity. And again, he's showing you all the horizontal intervals from his golden section grid. And there are other point-to-point -point relationships that suggest that he's showing you some of the verticals from that grid as well. This clearly 
is a, a remnant of the underpainting in the drawing. He's, he's clever. He's working in this oval. He's stacking up objects, overlapping them, playing with the circular form of this greenery, the piece of fruit in that jar, this one, the box behind it, the tabletop, the flat wall. These are residual marks from previous paintings because he always puts the golden section grid behind his models and behind his subjects. But these are all warm. And I'm sure that this is a very muted blue violet and it's in the Kia blue violet. Can you see that from where you are? Very tasteful, very controlled, very easy to live with and really very, very nicely done. He, he likes this idea. Hmm? I think he loses, these colors are too close to the color of the background, so he loses that vase but it's uh, secondary orange, violet. There is no green, but it, it's going in that direction. It's amazing. He doesn't do anything in a detailed way, but it's very effective always. And this is a dead duck. And you don't get much deader if you're a duck than this dead duck. But he's done a beautiful job with the arabesque and the colors are analogous. They're close to each other on the wheel. Again, he's getting very pretty color, very livable color. And none of it is intense. All of it's been reduced. Do you see it? Nothing is out of the tube. Here's a simple landscape. He goes, or went, he's passed away. He went summers to Italy and he painted landscape when he was there. And this is a, a view of a bay. And he's done a lot of heavy squinting to eliminate all of the details and arrive at only the most significant value changes of simple geometric shapes. So he has given you some hint of the tiled roofs in the foreground, but he hasn't wanted to attract, uh, draw too much attention to this. He's invested his major contrast at this point. That chimney brings it forward, but uh, these are all yellows and yellow oranges. Do you see it? There are no cool colors. So it's all analogous. It's all on one side of the wheel. It's all very unified. Here he's playing warms and cools. He's playing a light figure on a dark ground and a dark figure on a light ground. So this is counter change and this is a middle value. And it's not as successful as the others. It's a bit garish and it doesn't have much. Well, the sun is setting, I would have thought, and it's late in the afternoon and the sun is ripping across this this church, but I wonder why it's not on this wall. The colors are good, these greens are delicious, but you see how neutralized they are, very neutral. So Jan, you start with a neutral, not with a color, got it? This is um, when John's. There was an Augustus Johns who was, or John, who was a very famous romantic member of the Chelsea School in London during the early 20th century. And his sister went to Paris. She was really a very much better painter than he. Again, I think she had an affair with Rodin, but uh, she was really very, very good. And she's somebody I have the greatest admiration for and she and Helena Schreffbeck are terribly ignored. They're two female painters who I think have been overlooked and ignored and it's a shame. But uh, she is in her room, a garret in Paris. I think she sold well. I think she was pretty successful during her, her uh, time as a painter. And she's working on a raw canvas without much in the way of an underpainting. 
I think this could be considered a, a rough sketch. But she's obviously a tea drinker. And uh, in front of her fireplace, which probably has a, grass, a gas grill that you have to put money into to warm yourself in the wintertime. I lived in Paris for a few years, and I lived in England for 10 years. The shillings I dumped into my gas meter were considerable. But I think she's looking with some affection at this corner where she sits and reads and takes the sun because this is a similar corner in her room. And I suspect she has what's called a bed sit with a sink and a, and a toilet in a corner or she may share it with everybody on that floor. And the sun's pouring in and her umbrella's there, her wicker chair, and it looks like she's thrown a shawl over the arm. And this is an affectionate look at a corner of her brightly lit room, which she must obviously feel a great deal of regard and affection for. The drama of that diagonal, the fact that everything is warm and ranges of yellows and oranges except for that very neutral blue, blue, violet bit of cloth is stunning. This in the shadows getting, getting cool. Do you see it? That's real control, real economy, and bold shapes and directions running through the hole. It's good. I like, I like her work very much. This is very high key. Can you see what would happen if you're working with values that are just a little bit darker than white? neutrals and you're adding the tiniest bit of blue to them. Blue violets, red oranges, oranges, yellows, yellow orange. This is high key, low intensity, no hard contrast, flooded with light, absolutely flooded with light. Very successful. Very delicate, but what control, eh? And again, these measured vertical intervals running through the hole, the horizontal intervals running through, the way she's using the center to locate the teapot. It looks like a root phi rectangle. She's good. 1920, they speculate. She has a friend come and sit for a portrait. That wicker chair is there again. The color is richer, more intense, but not raw. <laughs> she does this beautifully. Doesn't she have a good time? The arabesque is subtle. If somebody hadn't brought your attention to it, you wouldn't have noticed it. Once you do see it, you have to smile. It's just a secret she shares with you. Hmm? And she's building this with these diagonals, isn't she? She's running them all the way through. Really very good. Look at how muted these violets are. Look at how much paint gets put on, meaning that she has to keep adjusting and overpainting and scraping and correcting this didn't come easily. It's a challenge. Hmm? It's a broader range of values, intensities, and color. And with all of these yellows and yellow oranges, she's in a violet, blue-violet key. Would you agree? And she, and she doesn't have to be intense. And she started Jan with neutrals. You can see that. And she had the values right, and then she adjusted the temperature. And I love the way all of these things flow. And these grays, the cool in here, the neutral in here is just delightful. This is cool as well. This is cool. In a different context, it might look warm, but up against all of those yellows and oranges, 
it's it's cool. Did somebody have a question? Are, there, are any of you awake? Grunt if you're awake. This is Jacques Villon. Uh, I happen to have a great affection for Jacques Villon and his brother Duchamp Villon, who unfortunately was killed by the pandemic after having served in the First World War. He's taking a square and he's dropping the diagonal to get a route to. And all these red and blue violets, I don't understand what he's doing. If you cover this, it's in the key of green, yellow, green. But he shoves this yellow in suddenly, cover that, and it's much cleaner. And boy, these violets, blue and red violets, are so subtle. And these neutrals are so diminished in intensity. And this is really the complementary opposite of all of that. And he's got this barrier separating them so that they don't jar. And they are very low in intensity. And he's using this dark line at the bottom because this is a street view of buildings, isn't it? Hmm? I love his color. I love his, I love his use of the golden section. I love how hard he squints and how he simplifies and reduces everything to two dimensions. This is, of all things, a farming scene. This is the back of horses pulling a plow, plowing a field with a course of conifers in the background. When he comes in on this Baroque diagonal and swings through and out, but again, his color is so delicately reduced in intensity. And I think he's got too much color going here to be in a key. But the predominance of greens and blue-greens, I guess, is giving emphasis to these oranges and yellow oranges. But he's not using the Fletcher the way we are. And this is a couple walking through a park. And I could never figure out what this is. It may be a chair and a picnic bla blanket. And again, he's using all of his golden section point-to-point -point relationships to fracture, reticulate, and break up that, that, that wall of green trees. He's, he's taking the sky and by breaking it into a series of horizontals, and making a feast out of those changes as he goes from intense and dark to lighter and lighter and lighter as he comes down, then he's throwing the woodland scene forward and then he plays with all of these field shapes in the foreground. He's not in a key, not the way we would use it. He's got too much color going. But he has zones in which all of this is predominantly green with low intensity red orange accents. And down here it's all in yellow greens with yellow and red violet accents. So he's dividing his, this fellow Jacobs who taught at the academy teaches painting in two keys at the same time. And that's what he does. He would have one key in this half and a second key in that one. And I think it's not very successful, not from my point of view anyway. And unfortunately, the illustrations he uses in the book I have of his, his lecture are by his friends who are third-rate illustrators, which doesn't help his case. This is Jacques Villon doing a self-portrait. And boy, when I was a young student, this, this guy, in my view, was God. I was so enthralled with everything he did and the way he used the section, the way he fractured color. I think he's very good. I don't know if you can see it, but what he's doing is he's taking, he's saying, I want to animate my face. I want to animate the painting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn everything into a cone or a pyramid. Can you see the apex of that two-sided pyramid and the third side? Can you see the apex here on a face there, there, and here of a pyramid? That eye is a pyramid, as is this. 
Do you see this is one side, another, a third, and a fourth? That's a pyramid, that's the apex. Do you see that what he's doing with the whole canvas is inverting so that you're looking inside of a pyramid that's going away from you? And it's, a, it's sort of a central vanishing point. But he has broken everything down into fractured pyramids. He's not using all of the coordinates, but they're giving him a way of fracturing in a unified way everything in the scheme. Here he's two-dimensional. Here he's deliberately three-dimensional. That head swells, comes toward you. The shoulder comes toward you. The hands are out of focus. He's not particularly interested. And I think he did well with the cast shadow of his head on the back wall. And again, he's playing with these verticals leading you to the head and these diagonals leading you to the head. Christopher Parrott had done a portrait of Claudia Rilling when she sat for the portrait class. And when he left the studios, he went back to Georgia where his family was living. He was originally from Portland, Oregon. And he did this multiple portrait of Claudia and fractured it beautifully and got a wonderful likeness of her as well. You can see her work on the internet now. She's graduated from the academy in San Francisco, was immediately offered and accepted a job as a professor teaching, and she's associated with a gallery, and her work is magnificent. Claudia Rilling, you might look her up, keep in touch with what she's doing. But, you know, Christopher really mastered the color, the geometry, and I want you to know when he came, he was color, he was value blind. He couldn't understand my criticism of his failure with value. And he would stand holding his chin in front of a canvas for two days until he believed that, that until he felt that he had understood what I was saying. He, he was having a terrible time with value. And this is an, an essay in value control. He's really in charge. He handles it magnificently. The way these successive heads recede, the way the background functions, the way these shoulders come throbbing forward, the games he plays with the arabesque. He's very good. This is you and Hublot again. Everything is reduced in intensity. You can see vestiges of his golden section grids. He leaves a lot of it. As we enlarge this, you'll see even further how much of it he leaves showing. But look at how he's bled down the color until it's barely a stain. Hmm? This is cool. These are cools. This is about as warm as it gets. Everything is formalized. Everything is broken down into straight lines. You can take all of these and see the coincidences as they course through the whole figure. You lay the calipers on, you can see how he found those divisions with his five calipers. And here he's got a very strong image of the model sitting on this stool in front of a dark background. And he paints his backgrounds and integrates them into the paintings. The drawing of the feet and arms is, I think, superb. Here he reticulates the pelvis, the feet, the crossed arms over the chest, the neutrals that he's playing with in the foreground. He's very good. Very good indeed. Strong form, reticulation. Remember, he's the one who reticulated the breads and their crustiness. He's right in charge of everything. And here's a game where he's playing parallel intervals coming across. He's running this from a radiator. I guess this is coming from a radiator. This is coming from some point. There it is. They're very dramatic. Very dramatic. 
This, I think, is extremely successful, except for what? What is it I'm going to, two things that I'm going to quarrel with, yes. At the foot of the bed, the bed clothes disappear and, and are attached to the wall. This? No, the bed the light, the wall. The buttons. <laughs> the buttons. There you go. These two things are this, like all in one, and you right. can't tell where one starts to one end. Right. And that this black here is terrible. The crack in the awful. wall. Yeah, it's a shame. He always has a moment of manifest bad taste <laughs> or poor sense of humor. I would argue that the way that cuts is all right, really? because this relationship defines it. But. Oh. Uh, but I think you're right. I think you're right. But but it's really beautiful the way the head recedes into the shadows. Yeah. Oh no. That's really beautiful. Right. And the structure of the pelvis is very good. And the the shadow side of the foot is clever too. Nice transition from knee to calf to ankle. This is called the diagonal. And it's in a root two, and it's a diagonal of the root two. And if you've been in my classes for any length of time, you've heard me say that this model, model for it for seven years, he was anal retentive in the extreme. And it took him forever to finish anything. And the last day she modeled, she finally got fed up. And she just stood up and screamed and ran all the way home naked through the streets of, of London. But you can see all of the golden section grids and relationships and uh, value changes and the muted color, which is what we're talking about. And there's this little wiggling of the toe, which is kind of cute, considering she had to hold that for seven years. So my argument now is that Color in painting in the hands of almost anyone who knows anything about mixing color is terribly reduced in intensity and never raw. Even those artists like the Fauves, who are famous for their powerful color, elaborately mix their color and reduce their intensities. I have books on the Fauves in the library as a group and as individual painters. I don't think it was a very important moment in the history of art. It was very short-lived. Matisse, Flamenc, and others got together. They were so besotted with color theory that they wanted to push everything to an extreme. They didn't really do any finished paintings, in my view. They were mostly sketches and experiments. And I think that they were helpful to painters who followed them. But things were breaking up at that time. And when you get Impressionism, when you get Romanticism, impression, when you get Romanticism, Realism, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Vorticism, Futurism, Dada, Up, Pop, Bing, Bang, things are changing this fast. You know you're living through a period of extreme chaos. And when you blend in things like the First and the Second World War, that huge pandemic which killed millions and millions of people, Freud screaming, God is dead, you can understand with Freud, Sheila, Klimt coming out of Austria, people were confused. The world was confused. We'd lost our bearings. Nothing made much sense. More, more millions of people had been killed by Hitler and Mao Zedong than anyone ever dared consider destroying. And Stalin was in there. He was killing everybody as well. I don't know how the American communists remained faithful to Stalin as the reports of all of that slaughter came in. I mean, it was terrible. What a thing to live through. And. Uh, most of us came later, when things were fairly settled, in a time of Eisenhower in the 50s. 
and things were quite f quiet for a little bit. You know, we had a Cold War, but it was quieter than it had been. So things really did, did get terribly disturbed. I'm going to suggest that we take a minute's break, stretch, come back, and then I will give you your assignment, and I'll ask you to do a quick sketch of this before you leave. You did bring your paints? Good. Let's take five. Thank you. All right, we're back. It's still Wednesday. Still color one. And it's still the fourth lecture. In front of you, you have an assignment. And it's got an underpainting at the bottom and an overpainting or the final coat above it. I'm going to suggest that you do a full value study for the first coat. Get everything working in value. There's a great deal that has to be done to make this work. And I'm going to do a value study on the blackboard to show you what it is you're expected to do. What we have is a 2.5 keynote. Thank you. The lightest value in the whole scheme is going to be placed up against a few of the very darkest values. So I'm going to lay in my light and there are some some things that we can do in the underpainting to guarantee that in the final coat we'll have placed emphasis where we want it. And one of the things that we can do right off the bat is come in and lightly define the edges. And then we can soften it but what we've initially done is made it more contrasty at the edges. I refer to this as edge painting. Then we're coming in and we, we're going to have a number six value. And I don't have the range, so I'm going to put in a fairly dark note. This is going to be a 5.5. This is going to be darker here. This is going to be a 5 on this side. And if I blend these out, I think you can see how emphatically I have forced that light against the dark background. Remember in drawing one, the highest contrast is always a subject. In this course, the highest contrast is always invested in the subject. Next week, I'll show you a bunch of paintings by Morandi in which he plays a different game. But I didn't want to confuse you too much tonight. I want to lighten this to about a 5.5. I still want to keep the dark up against this edge. I can get a little dark, a little lighter over here. And I'm going to get a good deal lighter as I come down here. Probably that's too light, but I can darken it later. I want a light value here. Because I want to bring this edge ahead of this frame behind it. And since this is going to be a 5.5, I can afford to give this a dark halo.
and I'm coming down here and I can be a little bit lighter here because I want this at a 6.5 to really drop back and I want the edge of this to push behind that wall. Then I want this to be thrown forward from this border. And I want this to be extremely dark. And it's a void as will be this shortly and that and I want this to go back smartly also and I want this to have a halo passing through that and this and I want this to be pushed back. So this and that are tucked behind the, the frame and these two are coming forward and I'm saying they're both the number four value. And I'll exaggerate this a little bit just for effect so you've got some idea of what the game is and I want this to get a little bit lighter in here and lighter along here filthy job this somebody's got to do it now I can come in here and strengthen this edge. I can strengthen that to bring this forward. I can add a little bit of reflected light in there. It will help that to look less like a hole in the, the canvas, the final piece. Black means, you know, I think it was Ansel Adams, a photographer, said there's never a pure black in a photograph unless it's a keyhole opening into an unlit room, which is unlikely. So we never use blacks or whites in painting or photography. So, this is the scheme. We're going to make this red-orange. So this is more orange than red. And we're coming in here and we want a violet and the blue that I'm bringing in should start kicking that orange. Is it doing it? should be. We can come in for a, a blue-green in here. This might be too light. It'll work. And we're going to go to a blue, something bluer here. 
And I want to, these chalks don't give me as much as I would like in the way of options. That should kick it, it did, didn't it? Hmm? And we could brighten this a little bit too. And if I put a blue line there and here, you see what that does? That's the edge painting. Remember, I lightened it before, now I'm, I'm intensifying the blue. So this is what I want you to do. We're going to come in with a violet And as I move over here, it calls for something pretty neutral. <laughs> then, of course, I have to lighten this to bring it forward. I can come in here. I can darken all of this to bring this forward. I can have a halo on that, which strengthens it. I can bring this down, which pushes all of this behind. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Is it starting to work? So that's what we want to do. We want to have a warped plane which comes ahead of the background in the upper right and lower left and tucks behind that frame at the lower right and upper left. And then if we uh, separate this from the blackboard, even though I haven't gone to any great lengths to make it pretty, it still, I suspect, will look atmospheric. Because the principles employed are that effective. So now it does look as if there's a hole in the blackboard in which there are all of these planes. Now, one of the things we want to do, and I'm not going to worry about the actual colors, is intensify this to bring it forward. That pushes this back. Do you see it? Forget the color, just the, the fact that I've done that. And we can do this too to bring this forward. Hmm? And we could, we could, we could uh, break that up as well. So I'm going to ask you to go out, look at the colors that are asked of you for the final coat. Underpainting you'll do at home. First, you'll make a neutral of the value that is asked for. Then you will modify its temperature by adding what other color is indicated by the code? Are you all familiar with what the codes mean? Value, intensity, and temperature. It's wonderfully simple. Hmm? This is a warm keynote, red-orange. Therefore, the painting is cool. Everything will be coming from the green, blue, violet side of the wheel, except for the red-orange keynote, which is also the highest contrasting value relationship in the whole scheme. So I've given you a very simple way of achieving dominance, unity, and a temperature sense of atmosphere. It's a cool painting with a warm note. It's a warm note. It's a warm painting with a cool note. Then you'll start looking at uh, a, a exceptions to these rules, and it'll be your task to figure out how the artist wrote that rule successfully and achieved their goal. 
knowing that they were doing something that was more difficult than a straightforward figure to ground relationship. And artists do set themselves difficult tasks to test their metal and to see if they can solve them. I'm sure authors do, musicians do, composers do. Even my Uncle Oscar does. So there you are. Are there any questions? Um, can you explain the edge painting? How, we, how would you go back in after you have put up any? Do you go, do you do that last after you've done My it? recommendation is you do it first. You do it in the underpainting. And you leave vestige of it showing. You never cover it. And in that way, it won't become too aggressive. If you put it in last and you're working into wet paint, you could really overdo it, muck it up. And then, of course, you'll blame me. <laughs> is the goal to wait till the underpainting is dry? Excuse me? Is the goal to wait till the underpainting is dry? We've been using, help me, Lauren, what is the gil Galkid Winsor Newton Galkid is a medium that when added carefully, not excessively, to your colors will prompt them to dry overnight. To dry enough so you can paint the next day. Because we have a week in which to finish these. And you should do a full final coat sketch so you can see what it's going to look like edit it and see what you can do to improve it. You want to have an underpainting, I say do a grayscale first. What I did here before I started adding colors. Let that dry and the gal kid will allow you to let it dry. So we're supposed to be mixing our colors with the medium? Yes. Oh. Oh. Yeah. What? Oh, I didn't know that. Gal kid. You can take a toothpick and add a little drop to each of your mixes. And certainly in your sketches, you're mixing up very, very little paint. Because your sketch needn't be any larger than that to achieve what you want to achieve. And you're seeking to see what these colors look like, how you're going to go about mixing them. Make all your mistakes in the rough. Maybe do two or three of these sketches. They're cheap, they're small, you can do them on regular paper or you can use a piece of canvas text chopped up or a couple of them on a piece of canvas text. It should go a long way to clarifying the problem, giving you an opportunity to see how you're going to mix. But remember, when you are mixing from one thing to another, this calls for a blue-violet, fairly intense, at a number four value. I'm coming down to a blue-green, very neutral, at a number five. And then I'm coming over here, and I've got a blue-violet, relatively intense, because as it comes up here, it gets extremely intense. This is a four, and that's a five. If I'm coming down to this, I want a six value, and it's a dead neutral. So. To mix to here, I take the blue-violet at four as a mix. I take a dead neutral. I take this and I start mixing this way. And I'm mixing this in and mixing more and mixing more in and mixing more in until I get here. And I have enough th this mix so I can start mixing with this color. And I can start mixing this one with that to get across. I can mix this with this to that, and this to this, and this to a point down here, and mix it over. It's very complicated in there. So the idea is to move toward this destination, adding a little bit each time to the mix when you add a row. And if you're going to work on a diagonal, the way you paint that, Work that diagonal across the whole painting so that you have a surface texture that catches the light uniformly all across the painting. It may glare, but you do this in front of a painting, you, 
you're standing there and suddenly it's glaring, you move a little bit, the glare goes away. But if it's going in 50 different directions, something will always be glaring because of the way the light hits it. And remember, I told you so, all right? So there. That's called fire insurance. Uh, any questions? Okay, pose please. Let's get set up. Doesn't have to be a large sketch. Let's see what your sketch is going to look like. <laughs> 